And good Sunday morning, everyone. Yes, I am not going to comment on how cold it is out there either. Oh, where'd Brother Stewart go? He left. Uh Uh-oh. There he is. Just getting down. All right, we're going to continue our lessons on knowing God. Knowing God, getting to know Him, hopefully, and, and you probably heard the phrase, getting to know Him in His economy, getting to know Him as He is, trying to understand what he is about, not from our, ourselves, trying to step out of our, our finite mind. It's kind of like trying to step out of our box, you know, do something uncomfortable every once in a while, get out of your little comfort zones. And knowing God is the same way because we get in a comfort zone of how we know God and how we want God to be, and we just stay there. So we're, gonna, we're trying to, Know God as he is. Take your Bibles, turn to James chapter 5. James chapter 5 and verse 11. James chapter 5 verse 11 says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful, and of tender mercy. Today, after discussing a lot of the attributes of God, omnipotence, omnipresence, His wisdom, things that we don't have, and after discussing a lot of His moral attributes, we've looked at His faithfulness, His goodness, His justice. Today, we're going to be looking at God's merciful. God being merciful, his mercy is what we're going to be looking at today. As we go down the line, we still have yet to discuss his grace, his love, his judgment, his holiness. And I started looking at this, and yes, I did look ahead into some of the lessons because I am going to be teaching some of them, by the way. So I looked ahead, and a question came to my mind yesterday as I looked at this. We've studied God's faithfulness, his goodness. He's just, he's merciful. We're going to be looking at he is gracious, he's loving, and he's, he's, he's a God of judge. And yes, we want that in our life. We need judgment in our life. We need people to keep us straight. Trust me, we need that. And we're going to be looking also at his holiness. But the question that popped to my mind as I looked at all these things was, what about this repels a lost person from God? What about all these attributes makes a lost person say, oh, he's loving? I don't want that. Seriously? He's just? No way do I want a just person in my life. Oh, he's merciful? (laughs) Forget that. What makes a lost person say that? What makes a lost person totally reject Jesus Christ because of his moral attributes? Why do lost people reject Christ? What is, what is the, anybody have any idea? And I'm not going to give you statistics because 75% of statistics are made up on the spot. But anybody have any idea what is, the, what is the biggest reason people say they don't get saved or they won't come to church? Anybody have a guess? Anybody? You don't know what I've done. Okay, yep, that, that's a big one. Not number one, but yeah, you don't know what I've done. I like that because I knew what Paul did. Paul got saved. Anybody? Anybody else have a guess? That's exactly it. Other Christians. Tell them this. Tell them it's not about other Christians. It's about Christ. It's about Jesus. And then throw some of these attributes out at them. Hypocritical Christians. Say, ah. Come on to church. One more is not going to hurt. Not going to hurt at all. But tell them. It's not about the Christians. Because what are Christians? Are we perfect? Absolutely not. We're just forgiven. And why did we need to be forgiven? (laughs) Because we are sinners. So, looking at these attributes, we're looking at the perfect moral attributes of God. God is perfect. If you look at His attributes... 
you will see perfectness in each attribute. Each attribute has to do with us practically and personally, each attribute of God that we have discussed makes me more and more confident and see the awesomeness of God. Because when I see that, yeah, I, I love people, but I don't love, love people. I mean, yeah, we say, you've heard people like that. You know, yeah, I, I went on a date, but it wasn't a date date. <laughs> well, what was it then, you know? I like them, but I don't like them like them. I love God, but as compared to God, I don't love, love God. I love people, but compared to the way God loves people, I don't love, love people. I, I, I got two sons, never sent one of them to die for anybody. Never have. A am I a good person? I, okay, there's, there's, no, there's nobody good. But remember, we talked about good-willed people. Are my feet in the right direction? I, I kind of hope so. But compared to God's goodness, I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm just, a, I'm just a person saved by Christ, depending on him to get me through this Christian journey. My heart strengthened to know that God is faithful, that he's always and only dependable and trustworthy. I see all these things in God and I start looking at it from God's perspective. It strengthens me and I hope it strengthens you because that's the goal of this. That is the goal of this. And yes, I can see the inequities in life. And remember last week when Pastor Hoiseth taught on, on uh, God being a just God and he talked about the inequities of life and it's inequitable. And how can God be just? How can he be just when he, when he does this, when these things happen? How are we seeing his justness? Through these eyes, through these sin-tainted eyes is how we're seeing his justness. We, were, we will never fully see what God sees until we get to heaven. So is it just? In God's eyes, it must be or it wouldn't be. See what I'm saying? So we don't need to question any of his moral attributes. Even justness, even, even righteousness, even goodness. Is God a good God? Well, a good God wouldn't allow this to happen. He would if he's trying to reach a goal. What's his goal? 2 Peter 3, 9. He's not willing that any should perish. He's trying to reach a goal. He wants all to be saved. So hopefully after this lesson, we're going to be more mindful and appreciative of his mercy, God's mercy. First of all, we're going to define or maybe more explain mercy. It's, it's tough to define it. We're going to have to use some words here um, that are synonyms to define the word mercy. But mercy has many usages in Scripture. We can't cover them all, so we'll only be able to cover the general meaning of mercy and its basic usage. So mercy defined is the outward manifestation of pity. And pity is one of the synonyms of mercy, so we have to use that to define it. But it's the outward manifestation of pity. And yes, in James 5.11 says, the Lord is very pitiful. Now it doesn't mean that he sits over here with a little long face, woe is me, they're going to crucify me. Or electrocute me, one of the two. But that's not what pitiful means. It means he shows pity. He's merciful. He shows mercy. That's what it means. He is full of pity toward his people. But he will also do what it takes to bring that person to salvation. How many of you were in the best time of your life? Things were just going great just days before you got saved. Anybody? Uh, not me. I know it wasn't with me. God had to bring me to a point in my life and say, hey, you can't do this. This isn't about you. You need me. 
You are a sinner. And until I could admit that, how can I get saved from sin that I didn't even believe I had? Yeah, the days were not, the days were not good. But is God good? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He is good. He is always good. So mercy is the outward manifestation of pity. Mercy is that eternal principle of God's nature which leads him to seek the temporal good and eternal salvation of those who have opposed themselves to his will. That's basically the definition by Bancroft. Read that again. Mercy is the eternal principle of God's nature which leads him to seek the temporal good and eternal salvation of those who have opposed themselves to his will. Synonyms, words that mean the same thing. Pity is one of them. Compassion, kindness, long-suffering. Those are words that mean mercy as well as the word mercy. It's help or kindness as the grace of a superior. Someone superior to you giving you help and kindness. Now, just by definition alone, just by definition alone, how many of you see God in there? Where you're at right now, today, how many of you see God in there? I see God in there. I see God in his mercy in my life, in things that have taken place just in the last year. How God has been merciful. How he's watched over. How he's been kind. How he's had loving kindness. How he's had pity. So, an attempted explanation of the mercy of God. And I say attempted because, again, even I'm not in God's economy. Oh, I stand up here and teach this. And I study this and I look over it. But when I try to put myself in God's economy, I'm just like you. I sit there and I, I, I try and I try. But I still see it through, through my economy, through our eyes, through my finite mind. But I try to explain it and see God's mercy as God sees as God wants his mercy to be put forth. So it's a pitiful attitude that exists in a relationship where there's mutual trust and faithfulness. And no, I don't, again, I don't mean that pitiful attitude of woe is me. What was that, what was that donkey? Winnie the Pooh's donkey, what was his name? Eeyore, yeah. That's not what I mean by pitiful. I'm not talking pitiful Eeyore here. Pitiful to be full of pity. To be able to have pity on someone, to be able to put yourself into their place and see where they're coming from. Has, has God ever put himself in our place? Boy, he did. Yes, he did. Put himself in our place. Does he have the right to claim mercy and be pitiful toward us? Yes, he does. So in other words, mercy ought to be a strong characteristic in a marriage or a close friendship. Because it, it's putting in mutual trust. When you get married, you better have a mutual trust in that person that you marry. And that trust does nothing but grow. When I trusted Christ as my personal Savior, it's something I had never done before. Something I had never seen before. So, yes, I trusted Christ as my personal Savior. And from that point on, I could trust him continually in my life. And I've seen that trust. And I've seen that, 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 uh, that type of trust grow as I've gone through in my life. So even in a close friendship, close friendships also have that trust. Anybody ever told a close friend something that, you know, you just, you just don't tell anybody else? You do that because you trust that they're a friend. You trust, number one, that they're not going to say something to somebody. You trust, number two, that they're not going to judge you for it. Yeah? That's what it takes. That's what it takes to have that close friendship. And it's never necessary for us to be merciful to God. We can be merciful, but we don't need to be merciful to God. 
We can be merciful to other people. And we can show that mercy. Uh, you know, for example, someone treats you bad. Someone says something about you. You do what the Bible says. You go to them, you talk to them about it. They ask for forgiveness. What's merciful? Forgive them. They're sorry. They want to start building that relationship back. You do that. That's mercy. We can have mercy one toward another. But there's no reason to be merciful to God. God has perfect mercy. Mercy assumes a need on the part of him who receives it. And resource is adequate to meet that need on the part of him that shows it. So for those who receive it, they have to have that need. God doesn't have a need for mercy. He's perfect. We have the need for mercy. We first of all need it from God. And then we need it from fellow Christians. Because we are not perfect. And please don't expect me to be perfect. As I won't expect the same thing out of you. As I've told people in the past, let's just lower our expectations and learn to love one another. How about that? I believe that's what God wants. And to be able to add a cup of mercy to that, that brew. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Where does our mercy come from? Primarily, it comes from God. By us going boldly to the throne of grace. When Jesus Christ was crucified, the veil was rent. We had access at that point straight to God. And the Bible tells us, come to the throne of, of mercy. Where he's going, to, he's going to give that mercy. He's going to show that pity. And again, I, I, I address the lost Anyone in the crowd who's lost, who doesn't know Jesus as your personal Savior, expect mercy from God. He will give that mercy. That's what he's there for. That's what he wants to do. So to sum up this explanation, I want you to turn over to Psalm. Psalm 103, 103rd Psalm. We're going to look at Psalm 103, and just a few verses in there to maybe help with this explanation. So Psalm 103, start reading in verse 4. says, Who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagle's, the Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses, his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward him that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth, that we are dust. There's pity there. There's mercy there that God gives. Notice in verse 8, it says, He is gracious and slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. That's the way, that's the way God is. How many of you had a parent, and I don't want to show of hands here, <laughs> but how many of you had a parent that you could go to, but when you did, they exploded? Anybody have a parent like that? It makes it tough to go to that parent a second time, doesn't it? How many of you ever had a, a, a spouse, 
I did the same thing. Makes it tough to get that trust connection. God, it says here, is gracious. He's slow to anger. He is merciful. You can go to your heavenly father and here's your expectation. You want to, you want to build an expectation, build it for God. That you can go to him and expect him to understand and have pity and show mercy on your sin. That's the kind of God we have. And lost person, if you can, if you can say to me, well, yeah, this is, this is just what I don't like about God. I, I need that explanation. I really need that explanation. Verses 9 through 12 said he, says he does not deal with us in anger and wrath as our sins deserve. <clears throat> says he will not always chide. Rather, he will keep his anger forever. To chide just, it, it's, a, it's a, a, an older word for debate, argue back and forth with. God's not there to argue back and forth with us because he lives on the mountain of right. He is there. His word is the mountain of right. So he's not going to debate. You ever, you ever get a ticket or see people get a ticket maybe and they argue with the cop about the law right there on the side of the road? He's not a lawyer. He's a cop. Yeah, he studied some law, but he's not a lawyer. Where's the place to argue or chide that ticket? It's in the courtroom. It's not right there. We don't want to argue with God. Trust me, that's one you're going to lose. That's one you're going to lose. Oh, plead for his mercy and plead for the salvation of others through God? Shh, you, better, you better be doing for that. That better be high on your list. But as for well, God, this, I, I know that you've, you've written clearly in your word, thou shalt not kill, but I just hated that person. It's, he doesn't get that. It's not in his economy. He, he doesn't understand that. He's merciful, but he doesn't understand that. Verses 13 and 14 says, He knows our frailties and has parent-like pity upon us. A parent should have pity on a child. They should have that, that relationship, that mercy on a child. How many teenagers have been through being a teenager before? How many of you, when you were teenagers, you'd, I've done this before, I know how to go through these teenage years. I didn't. Never been a teenager before. Never been an adult before. So, guess where I need to find help? I need to find it from people who have been there. Mom, Dad, you've been a teenager before. What do I need to do? Help me. And a pitiful parent will help you. A parent who has pity on you will help you. A parent who doesn't, go figure it out for yourself, kid. I had to figure it out for myself. Hell, how smart is that? I had to figure out a lot of things simply because of the way I was brought up. I had to figure out a lot of things for myself. I didn't let my kids go through that. <laughs> no way. Because I didn't want them where I was. That's the way God is. Well, God's never been down here on this earth. Oh, contraire, mon frère. Yes, he has. He knows. He walked it for 33 years. He knows what it's like. He's been tempted with sin. He knows what it's like. He's lost loved ones on this earth. He knows what it's like. He was hungry. He was tired. The Bible says in the shortest verse in the Bible, he wept. And he wept because he just lost a dear friend. Either that or some theologians say he wept because it was at that point he saw the direction Jerusalem was heading. I don't know. That's a whole other message and I didn't understand it myself either. So. But I want to dispel the fact that God is justice and judgment in the Old Testament and mercy and grace in the New Testament. Because all this was talking about the Old Testament. You're going to tell me God was just all justice and judgment on the children of Israel in the wilderness? 
Yeah, he was. Judgment and, and justice came about. But he also showed mercy. He fed them. He clothed them. Through the wilderness, 40 years. I can't get a pair of shoes to last me six months. 40 years. That would mean I would have to have a pair of shoes that I bought the year after we were married. I don't. I don't have anything after the year after we were married except for my wife. And I count that a privilege. <laughs> she said something I didn't hear. It might have been selective hearing. <laughs> but God is merciful. Even in the Old Testament. Now we are under the period of grace because that's at the point that Jesus Christ came and offered grace for everyone. Offered salvation for mankind. Any who would choose to accept it. Any who would choose. But all that, all that that he gave in the Old Testament was mercy. He showed them mercy so many times. What, what is, what is the, the life of an Israelite life like in the Old Testament? They sin. They go into captivity. They ask for God for forgiveness. God forgives them. Few years, few years, they sin. They go into captivity. They, they ask for forgiveness. God forgives them, shows them mercy. It's in the Old Testament. Too many people say there was just justice and judgment in the Old Testament. There was that. But one God speaks in both dispensations. He did not change at the crucifixion. The goal changed. The goal changed. God did not change. But at that point, it was when all mankind was offered salvation. Even the Jews were offered salvation based on the pictures that they saw from the Old Testament, the types of Christ. They were offered that salvation. Turn over to Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 and 23 says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. A compassion, again, that's another word for mercy. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. New every morning. Every morning we wake up and it's a new day. Everybody has the same amount of time in that day. You, talk, you, you want to talk about an equality? I'm going to talk about a world of equality. Let's talk about time. Everybody is given an equal amount of time for every day. Nobody gets any more. If it's your day to go, you might get a little less. But nobody gets any more. Everybody's given that equal amount of time. God gives us mercy every morning. And because of that, he is faithful. You and I are not consumed because of the Lord's mercies. I've experienced chastisement in my life and correction of the Lord for sins that I've committed. I've experienced that. I've, I've experienced a little, you know, hey, get in line, get in line. And when I didn't, it got a little harder and it got a little harder. What I'm finding as I grow, just like it was when I was a kid, and I learned I didn't want to get spanked. That the chastisements got a little less. My mom, my mom had that look. That if I was doing something and I got that look, I stopped. My mom was only five foot nothing. But she'd look at me even as a Senior in high school, she'd look at me, that look. Button up straight and right. I learned that look from my mom. I did the same thing to my kids. And I gave them that look. When we would have choir at our church, our kids would sit out and they were told, you got to listen, you got to just sit here, be good, sit here and be good. And when they wouldn't, 
I wouldn't have to say a word. They knew they walked right back to the corner of the church and stood there. Our pastor called it the wailing wall. That's the way I want to be chastised by God. I want God, to, the Holy Spirit, just to look at me and go, and me melt. And just go, oh, let's straighten that up. Let's learn to correct that. That's the way I want that correction to be. But at times, there's still a, a little, hey, get in line. Get in line. God never slapped me harder than I deserved. That's mercy. There are times when he probably should have slapped me that he didn't. That's mercy. It's God's mercy. And each of us could testify that, yeah, we've pulled a Jonah. I'm not going to do what you say, God. Yeah, we've been deceitful like Jacob. Let me see if I can get around this. God won't notice this time. Yeah, we've had that big mouth like Peter. Feared people like Saul. Not Saul of Tarsus, King Saul. Tried to act in our own strength like Samson. I did that for 10, 38, 28 years. Yeah, I, I can do this. I can do this. I've been to Bible college. I can do this. Yeah. It was Brother Jorkman said he got saved his first year at Bible college. It does something to you. Yet to see God's willingness to forgive and to be pitiful and restore us to the use and the life that we had for this old stumbling self, that's mercy. What direction are you heading? I don't know I've done that every once in a while when I get up here we talk about directions. What, what direction are your feet? What direction are you heading? To be facing God, to be tripped up by Satan is one thing. Satan is always looking to trip up a Christian, especially one that's doing something for him. But facing this way and a trip is one thing. But to be facing this way and have your back totally turned at God as a lost person, something totally different. Again, lost person. What's bad with this? This mercy that God gives, what's bad with it? I can't find anything. Turn to Jesus for mercy. Now because God and Jesus are the same, they're going to have the same attributes, right? We'll explain that one. Nobody could ever explain that one. Yeah, I know. I can't either. All I know is the Bible says it so. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not three gods, one in, three in one. That's just the way it is. Remember our explanation of mercy. Mercy implies a need, and the one who bestows mercy has the resources and compassion to meet the need. God has that compassion, that mercy, to meet all of our needs. We have it as well, just not to the same degree. So we always continually need to be given that mercy from God. Two amazing passages about the mercifulness of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 5 and verses 8 and 9. Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 8, says, Though he were a son... Yet he learned obedience. He's talking about Jesus here. Though he were a son, yet he learned, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. I think that's people's problem. I have to obey man? No. You have to obey God. But you have to see him as perfect first to make that okay. And until you see those attributes of God as perfect and he uses them in a perfect way and in a good way, you can't see yourself obeying him. 
Being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation. Only that's a merciful God. Eternal salvation. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Even if you mess up, you trip with your feet in this direction, you're still saved. He doesn't take that away. That's mercy. That's a merciful God. Jesus learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And then in Hebrews chapter 2, just a few pages back, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, said, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his, unto, like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. To be merciful and faithful high priest for us, it behooved him or it became necessary for him to suffer temptation as we suffered. Did he suffer temptation? Yeah. Satan wasn't going to have any of this. Satan came to him and three times tried to get him to bow down, tried to get him to worship him. What did Christ do? Did he just say no? I like that slogan, but then again, I don't like that slogan. Just say no and quote scripture. How about that? Because that's what Jesus did. He just said no and then he quoted scripture. I don't think that would pass on a slogan, but hey, I like it. Just say no. Quote scripture. That's what Jesus did. Yes, he was tempted. He was tempted. But because he was tempted, and he was his man on this earth, he now can have mercy because he's, as we say it, been there, done that. Been there, done that. Hebrews chapter 4, just a few pages forward, says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus never sinned. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when our weakness and sin put us in need, we can go to the throne with confidence and obtain that mercy that we have need of. Because Jesus never sinned. That's hard right here. Is it hard for anybody else? He grew up as a teenager. I'm going, a teenager that never sinned. How? A young man that never sinned. How? The Bible says he never sinned. That's tough right here. That's tough. But we have to see it in God's economy. We have to see it the way God sees it. Know him the way that God knows him. General Marquis de, La, de Lafayette was a Frenchman. He helped General Washington when the 13 American colonies were fighting for their freedom. And after the war, Lafayette returned to France. In 1824, he visited the good old USA, and an old soldier went up to him and said, Do you remember me? No, Lafayette says. Do you remember that the frosts and snows of Valley Forge asked the soldier? Oh, I'll never forget them, answered Lafayette. One bitterly cold night, continued the soldier, when you were going through your rounds, you came upon a sentry who was thinly clothed. He was slowly freezing to death. He took his gun and said, go to my hut. There you will find clothes, a blanket, and a fire. After warming yourself, bring the blanket to me. Meanwhile, I will keep guard for you. When the soldier returned to you, you cut the blanket in two pieces one piece you kept, you gave the other part to the sentry. And with tears running down his cheeks, the old soldier said to the general, here's half of that blanket. 
I am the century whose life you saved. One day we're going to give it all back to Jesus. We're going to get crowns. There's going to be crowns we can earn. We're going to throw them back at his feet. He's going to remember all of it. All of it. Will you be there on that day? Have you accepted the mercy offered by God for that day? Let's pray.